Welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell. This is episode 44. Today we are joined by Dr. Kate Hartman, who is an assistant professor of religious studies at the University of Wyoming. As listeners may well know, Kate was also the former director of Buddhist Studies Online, which was previously the sister site to Yogic Studies, which merged together in 2021. So, Kate, welcome back to the Yogic Studies podcast. How are we doing today? I am so glad, and I'm so glad that you've been taking care of Buddhist Studies Online, that students can now take courses on both sides more seamlessly, and that I get to you know, essentially teach without having to do all of the work that you guys do in the background, making all of this possible. Yeah, you bet. Uh, It's great to have you back on the podcast and also back teaching for us. Um, Another great collaboration. This time, talking about your love, your passion, pilgrimage and Buddhism, which is going to be our next online course. Uh, And so this is, of course the topic that you wrote your dissertation on and that you're now, I understand, nearly uh, having finished a a book manuscript on. Uh, So congratulations. Uh, What's the title of the book? Yeah, so the contract is signed. I'm apparently allowed to say that the book is now forthcoming. The manuscript has passed peer review. There's just some copy editing to be done. Uh, Coming out with Oxford University Press, it's called Making the Invisible Real. Practices of Seeing in Tibetan Pilgrimage. Mm, fantastic. And I understand students will get to read uh, some selections uh, before it's gone to press, students in the course. Is that right? Yes, we'll be reading some chapters from the manuscript. Uh, and so you guys will get a sneak peek before anyone else does. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I'm uh, I'm excited for you. Um to turn the the PhD into the book is definitely one of the goals of an early scholar, and uh, I'm sure that'll feel so good to have that in print after all of these years of thinking and writing and talking about uh, pilgrimage. Uh, and we're so excited to, you know, kind of at this stage of your of your journey of your <laughs> pilgrimage on this topic, uh, have have you share kind of this wealth of knowledge about this really important and fascinating topic. So tell us, um, you know, for listeners, we actually had you on the podcast back in 2021 when we first launched Buddhist Studies Online. It was sort of a celebration um, conversation and also to promote your BS 101 Intro to Buddhism course. So listeners can go back and listen to that episode. I think it's episode number 22. Uh, and we do kind of a deeper dive into your background and story and how you got into academia and the study of Buddhism. But uh, tell us kind of a, a shortened version of that here today. And specifically, how did you get into the topic of pilgrimage and Buddhism? Yeah, so this book is the culmination of 10 years studying pilgrimage. I probably started this as a graduate student around 2014. So 10 years of of hard work. Uh, The book, like I said, is called Making the Invisible Real Practices of Seeing in Tibetan Pilgrimage. And it explores the goal of learning to see a mountain as the divine mandala, the divine palace of a tantric Buddha that the tradition claims that it is. So for most people, a mountain just looks like a pile of rocks and snow. It looks that way to us. It looks that way to Tibetans throughout history as well. But the goal for Tibetan pilgrims was to learn to overcome this mundane perception and learn to see the mountain as the palace, as the mandala of Chakra Samvara. And so I look at various genres of literature and explore how they understood this goal, approached this goal, and tried to bring it about. And so the pro- this project emerged out of my PhD dissertation. And there's so many twists and turns that I really actually had to think about this when I was thinking about this question. How did I get started in pilgrimage? As a graduate student, you apply with a project, which is almost always a farce because you don't know enough yet to know what kind of project to propose. You know, unless, you know, Seth here, I think you came in with a pretty well-formed idea of your project. Um, That's true. Yeah, yeah, no, I had some garbage project that I'm too embarrassed to even talk about. And when I got there, I, 
you know, got to graduate school, I immediately abandoned it and kind of was searching for another project. And what my advisor at the time said was just go read Tibetan. Read as much Tibetan as you can. And in our weekly meetings, tell me about what you think is interesting. You know, and there's a lot of stuff to read. But eventually I stumbled across a um, a polemical text, a text making arguments about whether or not Mount Kailash was indeed holy or not. And this struck me as totally bizarre because everything that I knew up to that point was that in pilgrimage or in Tibet, pilgrimage is this important practice. Everyone agrees that it's this wonderful practice. You go to these mountains, this is how you do it. And so I was you know, surprised and delighted to see internal debate about whether or not a mountain was holy. And in particular, they were arguing about Kailash because some people said Kailash didn't look like a holy mountain. Hmm. I was like so intrigued by this notion that I started reading more and more about pilgrimage and about this goal that I had sort of taken for granted that, okay, everyone agrees the mountain is a mandala. Wonderful. Great. But what you get when you look closer at the pilgrimage tradition is you see Tibetan writers, thinkers, authors grappling with how difficult it is to change your perception of the physical world and thinking about how they could do this. And so basically from that initial, huh, this is strange, this is surprising, the whole project grew out of there. And in particular, I was just struck by the question of, we have these ideas about the sort of religious landscape, and then there's the physical world, and how do those things come together? And pilgrimage seemed to be a place to explore the productive tensions there. Before your PhD, you had also done quite a bit of travel in India and Asia, perhaps to Tibet as well. Um, tell, Tell me a little bit about how just some of those travels and experiences kind of informed your graduate work and maybe on the subject of pilgrimage. Did you ever get a chance to partake in any of these journeys to sacred mountains or uh, other other types of pilgrimages? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so as an undergrad, that's where I got my start in studying Sanskrit, Tibetan, Hindi. Um, I started going to India basically every summer since the summer I turned 19. The first summer I spent four months just, you know, started in Delhi, went down the Ganges, just going to every sort of sacred place that I could go. So during that trip, went to most of the sites associated with the eight holy places of pilgrimage in India for Buddhists, went to Varanasi, went to lots of places. And then that same summer, I did actually go to Tibet, which um, is quite rare just because of the political situation of the Tibet Autonomous Region in China. I was extremely fortunate and, of course, totally had no idea at the time how fortunate I was. And on that trip, we spent about a week in Lhasa and Samye. Um, And so did sort of mini pilgrimage things there, although that's not how I would have understood them. I was going very much as a tourist. And so I've spent some time in Tibet, haven't been to Kailash or those other holy mountains. Getting the permits for that is quite difficult for me. Um, but have done much more traveling in India because since that first summer, I've been back to either India or Nepal something like six or seven times for a total of about two, two and a half years traveling there and have been to lots of more local pilgrimage sites, even if I haven't yet been to Kailash someday. Yeah. I've, I've always had a fascination for pilgrimage, um, when I was younger, when I was about 20, I did this big pilgrimage walking up the coast of California. I think I've told you about that once. Uh, I did my senior thesis for my BA in religious studies on the holy site of Varanasi, as you just mentioned. So did this kind of big project. And then um, after I graduated, sold all of my possessions, booked a one-way ticket to India and went to well, not just Varanasi, but went all over all these different um, uh, sacred sites in India, but kind of culminating in Varanasi, where I had kind of amassed this knowledge of like, you know, the ancient um, sanctity of of Kashi. Um, And, uh, you know, pilgrimage is one of those things within, we study as scholars of religion that we see really does 
transcend as a category of study across different cultures, traditions. Uh, it might be one of those universal human things that humans uh, have been drawn to special places and have infused different types of places with certain meanings and sacrality um, that might look different. The goals, the, 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 the ideas, the theory behind those journeys might look different, but it seems to be something we can point to across traditions. Um, so tell us a little bit, kind of just thinking broadly about pilgrimage for Buddhism. Um, what, what are some things that kind of stand out that might make pilgrimage unique for Buddhists? Um, how, does, how does a Buddhist engage in pilgrimage? Yeah, yeah. I'm really struck by this idea about the universality of pilgrimage. And certainly as folks working in the study of religion, it seems to come up in every religious tradition that we're aware of, as well as in non-religious situations. So you think about folks who are really excited to go to Disney World or Disneyland or Dollywood, or even in terms of, as Americans, people wanting to go to you know, the sites associated with the founding fathers or the U.S. Capitol or national parks, right? It seems to be a feature of human society and culture and just human minds that places gather meaning to, to cite um, the philosopher Edward Casey, who's written about places. When you walk into a place that is rich with meanings, you just physically go there and these sort of historical meanings, the experiences of others who's been there, the stories that have been told about the place, the sights, the smells, the sounds, all of it washes over you in ways that exceed our, you know, discursive philosophical ability to talk about them. So there's something about sacred places that just humans have turned to again and again as a way of organizing the landscape, organizing the ways they think about the world as being filled with meaning. And so Buddhism, you know, is one case of this apparently nearly universal phenomenon. And, you know, what was interesting growing up in the U.S., which is highly influenced by Protestant Christianity, is one of the few places where pilgrimage doesn't play a strong or as strong a role or as recognizable a role. Because in the history of Protestant Christianity, the emphasis was not on going to sacred places. The emphasis was on belief and the Bible and those sorts of things. And even within Christianity, that's highly specific to a certain time and place. And so in the study of pilgrimage, I've become so interested in the ways in which different places, cultures have made holy sites and made pilgrimages to these holy sites. So... Just to pause for a second, I'm just what you, so many interesting things about what you said, but I'm wondering if maybe we can clarify, um, like how how do scholars, how do you view um, somebody who's going, like how do we define pilgrimage or a pilgrim? Is going to Disneyland a pilgrimage? Yeah. Is that how does that that how does that differ? Like, is Disneyland a sacred site because someone says this is sacred to me, or uh, how how are we to kind of think about um, a pilgrimage as special or distinct from other types of journeys? This is a huge question in the study of pilgrimage and tourism, which is to say, how do you draw the lines between these? So we have a general sense that pilgrimage is something in which the place is special, but not just special in maybe a mundane sort of way. Um, it has perhaps some deeper significance. And the person going to the site should have some respect for that deeper significance. But you can also have people who have a deep significance for places that aren't necessarily to have a religious significance. Say somebody who's a real you know, Disney adult going to Disney World, um, and that might mean a lot for them, but Disney World is not a place that traditionally has religious meanings ascribed to it. Or you might have people going to a place that's traditionally understood as sacred in some way, but they're going as a tourist that they just want to see some sacred sites, right? In week, in module four of the class, we'll look at this 
um, as it comes up in reference to Bodh Gaya in India, right? Sacred place, but how do you deal with the fact that you're getting mixtures of pilgrims and tourists coming to the site? Very real question. But so those are our two sort of ideal types of the pilgrim who's going for sort of sacred reasons. Of course, how we define sacred is also <laughs> a lot to be said there. Or a tourist who's going for more you know, reasons of entertainment and sightseeing. And those are the two ideal types, but when it gets to reality, it, it gets really, really difficult to pull these things apart. And, you know, we in the study of religion are familiar with this insofar as even the question of defining what is religion, similarly blurry edges. As to getting a definitive final answer of you're a tourist, you're a pilgrim, you're this, you're that, really, really difficult. Um, here's a, a fun personal example. So my mother this summer is going on the Compostela del Santiago pilgrimage for mm. the second time. Oh, wow. We were just we were just talking about that in our household, actually. Yeah. That's something my wife Charlotte wants to do. Yes. And it's interesting because this is a pilgrimage that has traditionally Catholic meanings ascribed to it. Mm -hmm. And yet it's also become... Um, you know, a metaphor for sort of spiritual journeys or of a way of engaging in slow travel or, you know, my mom is very Jewish. I think she wants to take a vacation where she's doing a lot of walking and also she wants to think spiritual thoughts. Mm -hmm. But, and so is she a tourist or is she a pilgrim? Right. It gets really blurry. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for me as a scholar, I always just take a step back and kind of analyze how people identify and how people fight about how other people should identify. Um, but from my perspective, it gets real blurry real fast. But my mom really loved it last time she went. So if, if you and Charlotte want to go. Um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We'll have to chat more about that. Um, but back to um, kind of the original question, which I realize I got you sidetracked on talking about Disneyland is um, how does how does a Buddhist engage in pilgrimage? And maybe this will help clarify, as you know, a specific religious tradition how how they conceive and define. Of course, Buddhisms are many, but if we're speaking kind of generally, how how does a Buddhist pilgrim um, engage in pilgrimage, and and why? Yeah. So this is a again a super interesting question because with pilgrimage in Buddhism, unlike say pilgrimage in Islam. You don't have one sacred place that everyone goes to, and you don't have a obligation to go on pilgrimage. So in Islam, it's one of the five pillars. If you are physically and financially able, you should go on pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in your life. For Buddhism, we don't necessarily have this same obligation to go on pilgrimage, and we don't have a fixed set of sacred sites. So Buddhist pilgrimage is highly diverse. And so when we ask the question, how does a Buddhist go on pilgrimage? I'd almost need to add, ask a little bit more. You know, are we talking about a Sri Lankan Buddhist pilgrim? Are we talking about a Tibetan Buddhist pilgrim? They do things that will often look quite different. Um, because you see that Buddhist cultural areas will tend to develop their own local pilgrimage culture that, again, can be quite different. And there are certain features that these different kinds of pilgrimages share. Um, we'll talk about those in the course. So, for instance, Buddhist pilgrim pilgrims like to go to places associated with the Buddha. They'll go to places where a relic or a remnant, perhaps of the Buddha's ashes for after he died, maybe a piece of his hair, maybe a tooth, is located. Um, and those will often be outside India. Or they'll go to places that are understood to be the residence of a bodhisattva or a god or a goddess of some sort. Or they'll go to temples, places where Buddhist monks live and where there are special images or things like that. So you see these themes across Buddhist pilgrimage, but the tradition is also highly, highly diverse. But there's also, the tradition does remember that there is a specific pilgrimage tradition in India that we have as what Buddhists take to be the oldest example of pilgrimage before you have all of these diverse, you know, um, different expressions of pilgrimage. So I can talk about that earliest account of pilgrimage, if you like. Yeah, please. I was going to ask. Yeah, tell us about kind of the, the, the history of pilgrimage 
um, within early Indian Buddhism, um, did the Buddha uh, uh, go on pilgrimage? Was his life a pilgrimage? Uh, did and kind of did did the earliest sangha did they have um, practices that we might call uh, pilgrimage? Or or yeah, tell us tell us about the origins of pilgrimage in Buddhism. Yes, so I'll give the perspective from the Buddhist tradition as it is remembered in Buddhist scriptures. And so according to the Buddhist tradition, the Buddha himself inaugurated the practice of pilgrimage. He wouldn't have necessarily gone on pilgrimage himself. Um, but the story is in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Buddha is on his deathbed. He's about to pass away after 45 years of teaching and gathering followers. And his chief disciple Ananda comes up to him and says, you know, what are we going to do? Oh, blessed one, after you're gone, we monks are used to being able to see you, to ask you questions, to learn from you. And what's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to this community when we can't just come up to you and ask you questions? What are we going to do? And the Buddha says to Ananda, okay, Ananda, after I've died, there are four places the sight of which should arouse emotion in faithful members of the Sangha who come to these places. And so he names four places that are specifically associated with the Buddha. So we have here the Buddha was born. And what's interesting is in the text, it doesn't actually say where that is. Uh, so the question of how you locate this on a physical map, but it's generally associated, associated with being here the Buddha was born, Lumbini. Here the Buddha attained supreme awakening, Bodhgaya. Here the Buddha first turned the wheel of Dharma. Here the Buddha first taught for the first time in Sarnath. And here the Buddha attained final Nirvana, which is to say that he died in Kushinagar. And so the Buddha tells Ananda that any of my followers, monk or nun, male or female lay follower, who visits this place with a faithful heart, and if they die while they're doing the pilgrimage, they'll be reborn in heaven. So he basically says, these are four places that you can go to. And he implies that it's a good thing to do, but he doesn't say that you have to or that you should. And so the Buddhist pilgrimage tradition sees that as its founding instance. Later on in the text, it also talks about how after the Buddha died, he was cremated and his relics were split up in and put into 10 different stupas around North India or Southern Nepal. And it's implied there that those stupas are also going to become places of pilgrimage. So in some ways, the pilgrimage tradition in Buddhism starts once you no longer have access to the Buddha himself, you now have access to either places that are associated with him or relics of his body that you can go to and in this indirect way, have access to the Buddha himself. Yeah, that's that's uh, fascinating, and I'm sure listeners can think of other examples from other religions or traditions where um, pilgrimage routes today that are associated with different saints or religious leaders, or you know, connecting to that teacher or master after they've died. I think is another common thread. Um, so, how does that that tradition kind of further develop? after the Buddha's passing and as Buddhism becomes more institutionalized mm -hmm. in India, but then also travels, you know, beyond India into other, other countries in Asia and beyond. How does the pilgrimage tradition, in your view, kind of change and continue to develop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so after the death of the Buddha, we see these four pilgrimage places become important. But then we also see the growth and the rise of new pilgrimage places, new stupas, essentially the expansion of the network of the Buddha. That, you know, initially their holy sites are relatively closely located to the area where the Buddha himself would have lived and preached in the area known as Magadha, which is to say northern India, southern Nepal. But as Buddhism's influence expands, you see it move sort of across India and then pilgrimage traditions arise in the rest of Buddhist Asia. And it is worth saying that I gave you the scriptural account. And, you know, 
historians who look at archaeological records, inscriptions, other versions of these texts often have questions about how exactly these traditions developed and whether or not we can sort of trust scriptures to be accurate representations of what historians think the past looked like. But it does seem to be that the pilgrimage tradition goes back at least to the third century BCE and that it expands from that area in northern India. And we go into this much more in depth in the first module, talking about specific pillar inscriptions of Ashokan pillars and things like that. But for now, we can just say that the pilgrimage tradition understands itself to be started by the Buddha and expand from there, uh, and that the historical record is somewhat more complicated. So it sounds like kind of the earliest, at least from the scriptural uh, remembrance of this practice that's being taught by the Buddha, the historical Buddha himself, to his close associates and Sangha. So those would have been other monastics. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but we over have time, what's that? In the Mahaparinibbana, it specifically says monk, nun, lay followers, male lay followers, and female lay followers. So there's a specific shout out oh. to lay people. Oh, okay. Well, that that was going to be my question: is that is that who 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 is able to practice this? What is it? Just monks and nuns? Sounds like from the earliest um, teachings, there it's being aimed at a larger non-monastic as well audience. Yeah, yeah. and in a way, it becomes more accessible than certain other ways of engaging the Buddhist tradition. Right. So, throughout most of Buddhist history. Only really monks or nuns meditated, and even then a, a relatively small number. Only really monks or nuns engaged in deep philo philosophical study of the textual tradition. However, every record we have shows lots of lay participation in pilgrimage, also lots of monastic participation in pilgrimage. It's not as though it's lay people to the exclusion of monks, as not monks to the exclusion of lay people. Everyone can and does go on pilgrimage. Yeah, so it's a more accessible practice in that way. At the same time, going on a, lar a long journey, pr probably by foot, uh, would require setting aside quite a bit of time and resources. So on the one hand, it doesn't require perhaps being a full-time monk or nun, but it does in some ways require you to um, become a full-time religious practitioner, you know, setting aside your life for a certain period of time, right? Can you talk about a, a, what what that might have looked like historically with these long journeys on foot? Mm -hmm. Yeah, from our best historical guess, because this is hard for historians to know about exactly, is that you would have a small number of people who are traveling really far to go to these central pilgrimage sites. And we even have records of some of people coming from as far as China in the 5th century to come to India to go to the central sacred sites. But the Buddhist pilgrimage tradition is flexible insofar as it's not as though, oh, you can't go to Lumbini and Bodh Gaya, like, you know, get out of here. Because of the expansion of the network of stupas, stupas being reliquary mounds, burial mounds that are said to contain a bit of the Buddha's relics, the networks of those spreads out such that no matter where you live in the Buddhist world, there's probably a stupa not so far from you. And so in lieu of going on these very long pilgrimages, people often have relatively closer pilgrimage sites. So for instance, um, I lived for two different summers in a Tibetan Buddhist nunnery in Ladakh. And for those nuns, maybe once in their lifetime, they would have aspired to go to Bodh Gaya, Lumbini, Sarnath, something like that. But it was very expensive. It was difficult. And so you had relatively closer pilgrimage sites to go to, to visit monasteries or stupas that were relatively closer that you could do on a yearly basis or things like that. And so the Pilgrimage tradition is very flexible in that way, in that it's not, you know, y you go to Mecca, it's very expensive. Probably a small number of highly motivated people do make those very long journeys, but most people go to pilgrimage sites relatively closer to them. 
and particularly when Buddhism disappears from the Indian subcontinent around, you know, the year 1300, then you really don't have Buddhists necessarily going to India nearly as much anymore. And so you have focus on these more local pilgrimage sites. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, they, they say it's not about the goal or the destination, it's about the journey. Um, what, what would the Buddhist response to that be if someone said that to you? Um, would, would a Buddhist pilgrim sort of agree with that kind of general cliche? Um, and how does pilgrimage kind of, is it, would you see it, would a Buddhist see it as a form of merit making? Um, or what are the, the, the kind of primary goals of pilgrimage? Yeah. Um, I'm laughing because I actually did have a student in one of my fall uh, classes. This was this class was Buddhist ethics. And he, he wrote this thing about it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Um, and I had to say to the student, what does this have to do with our readings that we've done for the class? And he <laughs> said, I don't know. It just sounded philosophical. <laughs> said, I know you had a busy week. Maybe, you know, rewrite this specifically engaging with the Bodhicara of Atara, which we were reading at the time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe he had been paying, paying very close attention to your lectures, Dr. Hartman. Yeah. Well, so as far as something saying it's not about uh, the destination, it's about the journey, I think that would be quite foreign to uh, a a Buddhist pilgrim. Uh, they would mm. be wanting to go to the destination to get access to whatever <laughs> sacred traces of the Buddha or whatever sacred objects are there. Right. That said, part of the reason the journey is important is because often for Buddhist pilgrimage, the the journey is part of an ascetic practice, which is to say a difficult practice in which you deny ordinarily, you know, easy sense pleasures. It's difficult to travel to places. And insofar as you are undertaking this difficulty to go to this holy place, that itself can, you know, accrue you some good karma, good merit burn off some bad karma, expiate some wrongdoing. The ascetic dimensions of pilgrimage are definitely part of it. And a lot of pilgrims will take on temporary vows while they're on pilgrimage to, you know, not drink, or they're going to observe the precepts in a stricter way. And so that itself can be super important. But the you know really special thing is getting in contact with that holy place or object, which is going to yield a lot of good karma, good merit, some purification, some sort of beneficial result in this life or the next life. Because particularly for lots of Buddhists who are not currently monks or nuns, they might see attaining total awakening as a very, very distant goal, maybe one that's not going to happen in this lifetime. But going on a pilgrimage can give you lots and lots of merit that can hopefully kickstart your next lifetime's progression towards awakening. So the journey's okay, but it's really about the destination. Yeah, I've, you know, people always ask me this. Um, and I've been searching and searching to find somewhere where a Buddhist scripture or text deals with this specifically. Oh, yeah. In, so I have an article in the Revue des Tu uh that's called Against Pilgrimage. And so while I was doing my research on pilgrimage, I would come across scattered things in which Tibetan authors were saying that pilgrimage was a bad practice, that it was a waste of time, that you shouldn't go on pilgrimage. And these guys are a minority, but you find voices like this in every pilgrimage tradition, which is to say that people are not going on pilgrimage for the right reasons. They're not being, not taking advantage of this. Better to just stay at home and actually study the Dharma. And one of the things that comes up again and again is that when you're on the journey and you're away from your home and your routine, it's much easier to do wrong actions. And so in a lot of the Tibetan advice literature, you find people saying, hey, while you're on that journey, don't, you know, fall into gambling or drinking or, you know, sometimes when you've been traveling all day, you're um, not your best self in terms of being kind and generous and all of these good qualities. Mm. So if anything, for a lot of these authors, the journey was an opportunity for you to rack up some bad karma that you should, that pilgrims should be very careful to avoid. 
So tell us more about this um, this literature that you've um, studied and engaged with. Um, what kind of what kind of texts on pilgrimage um, are out there, um, and uh, is it specific to the Tibetan tradition that you've worked on, or uh, what other types of literature on pilgrimage? Yeah. So my specific work is on the Tibetan pilgrimage tradition, which is like all regional Buddhist cultures, a mixture of what we can say pre-Buddhist practices around there being holy beings that dwell in mountains or that you need to sort of make offerings to sacred trees or things like that, mixed up or overlaid with Buddhist ideas about pilgrimage. And so, you know, initially when I was putting together this course, I thought to myself, I don't really know very much about pilgrimage in Sri Lanka or Thailand or these sorts of things. And so, you know, now that I teach about these types of things, I know enough to to teach on them. But my expertise is definitely in the Tibetan tradition. And in the Tibetan tradition, you have pilgrimage to aspects of the built landscape, so built by humans. That'll be monasteries or sacred cities such as Lhasa. And you have pilgrimage to aspects of the natural landscape. So sacred lakes, sacred caves, and especially sacred mountains. And so I especially study pilgrimage to sacred mountains in the Tibetan case. And I read a lot of genres of literature dealing with this. This will be advice texts written for pilgrims about how you should do pilgrimage and how you shouldn't. So just what I was referencing there. Pilgrimage guides, which explain you know, hey, when you go to Disney World, here's what you should do. Here's what you should see. Here's the history of this particular thing um, with reference to the Holy Mountain. Polemics, making arguments about which mountains are sacred or are not sacred and other philosophical issues. Um, Because when you dig into the weeds, Buddhists will want to say, you know, How does this align with philosophical ideas? How does this align with the concept of emptiness, for instance? I also look at pilgrim diaries, so records written by pilgrims about their own experiences, and then historical accounts about the founding of sacred places. And so all of these different ways in which people write about pilgrimage. That's amazing, actually, that there's that much different genres of literature. I'm just thinking for medieval hatha yoga or something if we had these first person accounts of somebody writing in a diary about their experience doing yoga or like there's there's really just nothing like that you know we have a few paintings we have sculptures very little epigraphy um and then we have you know maybe a couple dozen or or more sanskrit texts written mostly by brahmins um maybe at a matta or, or a monastery um, and, and not a whole lot else to kind of construct this entire history of these, of these traditions. Um, so that's fascinating itself that there's all these different vantage points that you're able to kind of approach pilgrimage, um, from. Mm-hmm. Yes. And when I talk about this project to especially, you know, kind of old school scholars who, you know, think that you should really drill into exactly one kind of text and one sort of thing. Um, they say, how many different kinds of genres are you studying? Uh, But I'm the kind of person, I'm the kind of scholar who loves having these multiple windows into the tradition. And certainly, you know, when I look at the records in Japan and China, which are so much, there's so many more resources that are well-preserved than in the Tibetan case, but where we have many more resources than the Indian case, uh, where, Mm -hmm. you know, preserving texts is is so much more difficult and uh, you don't necessarily have the same phenomenon of diary keeping. Yeah. How far does that go back in Tibet that you have, let's say, diaries of of pilgrims? Well, so you have much more of, like when you said in the Indian case of Brahmins writing stuff, uh, in the Tibetan case as well, in the pre-modern period, it is all high-ranking lamas writing. You really... Uh have to look hard for the perspective of your kind of average Joe Buddhist. And so the one pilgrim diary that I have is actually from the 1940s. And this is an extremely valuable resource insofar as it's right on the eve of 
the Chinese invasion. And so, you know, it's the only source of its kind that I've managed to locate or that I believe exists because we do have records of Tibetans keeping diaries, but the notion that you would then publish your diary would have been considered very sort of egotistical and strange. And so we yeah. have like tantalizing clues that lots of Tibetans kept diaries, but they're not accessible to scholars, you know, and you know, I don't want people reading my diary years in the future. Yeah. So what, tell us more about then the pre-modern um, pilgrimage literature and what we, what you've gleaned from that about the different types of pilgrimage and um, theories of pilgrimage. Tell us a little bit more about what you've learned from studying those texts. Yeah. So in the, the pre-modern period, you do have records of the foundings of sacred places, pilgrimage guides written for pilgrims going to these sacred places, and then accounts of high-ranking people and their experiences on pilgrimage. And so from all of this, we can see that it was this goal for pilgrims at any rank to go to the pilgrimage site and learn to sort of look at the mountain and see it as this sacred mandala. But this was considered very, very difficult and only rarely achieved. But that said, even for the relatively lower ranking people and in the pilgrimage guides, it'll say, try to do this. And so even for those who are not able to do it, the exercise of trying to see and becoming aware that your mundane perception prevents you from seeing the world as it truly is, is itself a valuable exercise insofar as it highlights, it shines a light on the way in which our sort of ordinary obscurations, our delusion, our attachment, our aversion prevent us from seeing the world as it is. And so pilgrimage becomes this embodied way of learning about the goals of the Buddhist tradition and about transforming your perception so that you can see the world as it really is. You mentioned the importance of, uh, I think it was lakes, caves, and mountains. T say a bit more about the importance of sacred geography, the landscape, the environment, and how that kind of shapes and can transform the awareness and perception of the pilgrim. Yeah, so the Tibetan landscape is, you know, famously dramatic. You have these big, big skies, you have huge mountains and then valleys and mountainous lakes and cave formations. And as someone who lives right now in Wyoming, a, a landscape that I consider quite similar to Tibet in certain ways, you're always just struck by the power and the majesty of this landscape. And historians aren't supposed to speculate about, you know, why, you know, things like landscape that we don't necessarily have specific textual resources for. Like no Tibetan was like, here's the reason why I think mountains should be a, a place of pilgrimage. We just get it already sort of formed. But the Tibetan landscape is so strikingly different from the Indian landscape and from the landscape described in Buddhist suttas and things like that, that it's not surprising to me that different ways of engaging with that landscape arise. And in particular, mountains become seen as, right, so you have a mountain it reaches closer to the sky. You can get the sense of mountains are a place where that which is above in some metaphorical sense connects with our human world. And so in the Tibetan case, mountains will often be regarded as the dwellings of gods or bodhisattvas, and they'll be gendered as male. And then the nearby lake, because often a mountain and a lake will be paired together, the lake will be the sort of female counterpart. Mm. And because Tibetan Buddhism draws on, you know, tantric, Vajrayana practices, this union of the male mountain and the female lake is often representative of, you know, 
compassion and wisdom of the union of these two things. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. And is, as you're talking, I'm imagining re- recalling some of my own journeys up to, to places like Ladakh, um, you know, uh, up in the Himalayas and the expansive kind of desert mountain landscape that kind of just being there, the open sky just sort of does kind of expand your mind um, in, in certain ways that you kind of can't help just from that kind of um, awe-inspiring beauty um, of, of the landscape that just sucks you in. Um, yeah. You feel like you're on the moon or something and yeah. And then there's all these, um, stupas and gompas or monasteries that are even higher. They're always perched up on, you know, a hill or, or, or a mount. And so you're, you're climbing up even higher to get to them. And, um, the, the view from the, from the top is, uh, exquisite. Um, but I can then also remember going into certain kind of cave dwellings and visiting um, mm-hmm. various practitioners. And um, it's, uh, it's both isolating and expansive. Um, and so I could see how just that natural landscape would shape the culture of practices and traditions. And um, I think quite quite unique compared to other uh, forms of buddhism um, in that way mm-hmm. yeah the the just the striking nature of these mountains and like the immensity of them and the sky and um one of the things that i'm really excited for in the course is that for each of the pilgrimage places we'll be studying i found a video of someone either sort of walking through the site or touring around it And so for the little mini unit on Kailash, there's the video record of um, a Tibetan trekker who who leads tourists to the site, um, walking around and going around and shooting video the whole time and talking about his experiences being there. And there's one shot in particular that I'm thinking of where he's looking at the mountain, you know, 10 miles away. It's what he's going to trek to today. And he says, you know, how could you look at this landscape and not think that it's special, right? You can see the remnants of ancient monasteries and Buddhas walked here and Milarepa walked here. And it's just so clearly not of this mundane world of ours. It is special and different. And, you know, I want to go get a piece of that to experience that sacred place so that then when I leave, I still have this memory, this experience that I can use for inspiration and all of these, you know, bring that forward. So let's talk more about the, the course specifically. Uh, let me share my screen here. We'll pull up the new course uh, registration page here. Oh. BS 110 Pilgrimage and Buddhism, uh, which will run live from March 25th to April 19th, 2024. If you're watching this in the future, everything's been recorded and it's all available for self-study. Uh, when this podcast airs, though, this will all be live and um, open for enrollment. Uh, so let's go down. Let's um, let's take a look at the four modules and um, maybe just give us a little preview here of the course uh, and what students can expect and what, what you hope that they'll take away from this course. Yeah. So my sort of overall goal with the course is to understand and experience the diversity of Buddhist pilgrimage, because like I said, there's no one central set of locations, no sort of requirement to go, no one way it's supposed to be done. And so Buddhist pilgrimage traditions are amazingly diverse. And I just love to, you know, see and experience that. And so my hope is that by taking this course and doing the readings, watching the videos of sort of walkthroughs of a lot of these sacred sites, you'll get to experience, at least in a small part, the experience of visiting sacred sites like these. And if you do get to go, you'll be prepared to appreciate it even more. Um, And so that was my goal in setting up the course. So in the first module, we look back at 
sites of Buddhist pilgrimage in India itself. So we, of course, talk about, you know, what is pilgrimage? What are some themes associated with the study of pilgrimage? But then I structured this first module around the the famous eight sites associated with the Buddha's life. So in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, they talk about four sites. But if you go on pilgrimage to India today, you'll hear talk of the eight holy sites of the Buddha, the eight major sites or the eight chief sites. And they're broken up into the four most important ones and the other four. So we spend time going through these eight. And I talk about the stories associated with them. We look at a lot of art historical representations of these places or the stories that are said to have happened at them. Then we look at this early scriptural sources for what we know about the pilgrimage tradition, some of the texts that supply the stories that come to be associated with pilgrimage places. And then we look at what historians know from non-scriptural sources. So what do we know from Chinese pilgrim records, Ashokan pillar inscriptions, other translations of or other versions of scriptural sources and art historical records. And so we look at all of that to get this multi-layered understanding of pilgrimage in India. And, you know, so I start with what's pilgrimage, here are the eight sites. We then look at the history, which interestingly enough is, is confusing, is, is, is changing, is de- highly debatable. Then we almost hit rewind. We say, well, how do we get these eight sites? And then we look at the modern history of the reclamation of Buddhism in India and how these particular eight sites come to be seen as the eight sites, which is an, a story that has lots of surprising twists and turns, shall we say. And so then in the second module, these are focused on relics and miracles. So sites that are associated with a relic, a remnant of the Buddha, or sites where the Buddha is said to have performed some miracle, often associated with a relic. And the three sites that will visit are the Jokong in the center of Lhasa, uh, Wat Pratat Doi Sutep in Chiang Mai, which is you know, a site up in the mountains where an elephant is said to have been released by the king holding a relic of the Buddha. And the elephant slowly walks up the mountain as the whole army follows it. And then eventually the elephant stops in a certain place. And the king says, okay, here's where we'll build this temple to a relic of the Buddha. And then last one, the Temple of the Tooth, um, Sri Dalada Maligawa, Maligawa. One of the things about studying pilgrimage across the Buddhist tradition is when I'm outside of Sanskrit and Tibetan, my pronunciation gets <laughs> gets confused. My Sinhala is not good. But so we'll look at this site in Kandy that holds a tooth relic of the Buddha. And again, in this case, we'll look at the legends associated with this place, the history, and explore some of the major places associated with them at these places. Next in module three, Holy Mountains. This is kind of my natural territory, so to speak. And we'll look at two mountains in particular, Wu Tai Shan, which is one of the sacred places in China, said to be the site of the Bodhisattva Manjushri. And then we'll look at Kailash in Tibet, said to be the site of Chakra Samvara. And because Kailash is the focus of my book project, we're going to look at Kailash from a couple of different angles. So we'll read some of these pilgrim diaries, we'll read pilgrimage guides, and you'll get to experience some of these primary sources in looking at Kailash. And then in the last module, we'll look at pilgrimage and tourism in modernity. So some of these issues that we were talking about earlier How do Buddhist pilgrimage sites adapt, change, deal with the influx of tourists to these sites? Or how do they deal with the changes of modernity, broadly speaking? So in particular, we'll look at pilgrimage and tourism at Bodh Gaya. So Bodh Gaya, which is where the Buddha is said to have gotten enlightened, was a holy place for hundreds of years, then Buddhism largely disappears in India around the year 1300. In the 1800s, the the site is rediscovered. And there's lots of debates about who gets to control the site, who gets to go there, 
how it should be managed. And then today, as you have this influx of pilgrims, what does that mean for the local population? Um, how does tourism hopefully benefit them? We'll look at issues such as NGOs raising money for schools, uh, how the local economy has been transformed. You know, all of these issues of modernity that come with a site becoming the focus of a pilgrimage tradition. We'll also look at Shikoku Henro, the Shikoku pilgrimage in Japan, in which pilgrims go to this island and travel to 88 sacred sites on the mountain. So we'll look at the history of how this site originated and then what it's doing now, particularly as religion in Japan is less people officially affiliate with it. And so the tourism agencies have started to market this pilgrimage as much more of a secular cultural phenomenon rather than as a Buddhist phenomenon. So we'll look at some of the dynamics there. And then lastly, we'll look at Amye Machen in eastern uh, Tibet, Amdo region, Qinghai. And this is a place that Tibetans have historically gone on on pilgrimage. But as Tibetan religious practices have been restricted by the Chinese government for political reasons, Tibetans have had to rethink their relationship with these mountains. And so we'll read some of the poetry by the Tibetan author and activist Usair writing about going on pilgrimage and having these conflicted feelings about her past, but then also seeing mining practices arise, not being allowed to carry a photo of the Dalai Lama, you know, thinking about Tibetans in exile who can't come at all. And so we'll just see how... Tibetans are reimagining their relationship with sacred landscape under the conditions of Chinese occupation of Tibet. So this is a widely scattering thing. We're not necessarily going to say, okay, here's 500 BCE and then proceed in a direct historical lineage, but rather jump around and gain an understanding of various pilgrimage places and the stories and dynamics associated with them. Amazing. Yeah, it sounds like a wonderful course. Uh, I'm sure many people will be asking you to lead pilgrimages to these sites. <laughs> I have after. led Wyoming students to um, Doi Sutep um, because I lead these uh, study abroads to Thailand. So that one, I have led students, although I wouldn't classify them necessarily as pilgrims. Yeah, I was actually, I was going to ask about that, you know, because something I think about too, as you know, I've, I've been leading these, um, these trips, I, sometimes I don't know what word to use even to describe them, but these, these journeys, these trips to India for yogic studies students, and it really is it's sort of a combination, I would describe it as of, of pilgrimage, of study abroad meets kind of Indiana Jones element of discovery and mystery. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, it's not a traditional pilgrimage in the sense that we're all, you know, members of a particular religious group and we're going, you know, um, to, to, to kind of have that religious or spiritual experience within a one particular tradition. Um, but it's not also, you know, for, there's many different intentions of, of the different types of, of group members there. Um, but it's also, it's not, not a pilgrimage. Yes. <laughs> These blurry lines. Um, oh, yeah. Blurry. And yeah. And so maybe it's a little bit different with study abroad with university students where maybe those lines are, you know, a little bit clearer. Um, but still, I think that's what makes it kind of interesting and messy that these lines between tourism and pilgrimage, um, are, are naturally blurred for many today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I talk about this a lot with students because we are going to places that locals regard as sacred, um, but we ourselves are engaging the academic study of religion. So, you know, in the case of teaching at the University of Wyoming, the lines have to be very strict insofar as I am an employee of the state of Wyoming and therefore cannot in any way be teaching the practice of religion to students. I teach about right. the history of religion. Um, and yet, so we want to, we're tourists, we're students. And yet when you're going to a sacred place, understanding the history, um, behaving respectfully, all of these kinds of things are things that we talk about extensively. And 
right? What does it mean to visit a sacred site respectfully? How, how do you engage when, you know, you're not visiting it in the traditional way. And there's some people who are there on pilgrimage and there's some people who are there as tourists and there's some people who are somewhere in between and maybe even day to day, depending on people's mind and intentions that might be changing. So these are issues that I think about you know, a lot. Make sure you take your shoes off before you go into the temple. Yes. <laughs> yes. We had on this last trip, we actually had participants who di didn't know that they needed to uh, and then took their shoes off or their sandals off, but didn't want to leave them outside the temple because, you know, fear of them maybe getting picked up or stolen, didn't want to just leave them out with these big piles of sandals. So put them in their backpack and then walked into the temple mm -hmm. and the temple security saw that they had put the sandals in the backpack mm -hmm. and uh, that's just as bad because you've brought these kind of these dirty, you know, mm -hmm. sandals at the bottom of your feet that are picking up dirt that are kind of representing this kind of like lower base, um, bad energy bringing and bringing that into crossing over into the sacred kind of uh, arena of the temple. And it's, a, it's a, it's a no, no. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they had to, they got kicked out and had to go in the end, go put their sandals back in the pile with everybody else and then could come back in barefoot. Uh, but it's just little things like that, that are different across different traditions and sites. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but, but studying and learning these traditions, studying, taking a course like this, uh, regardless of what your um, identity or intentionality is, is going to help to make you a much more respectful and informed traveler or pilgrim mm -hmm. when you go to these types of sites, right? Yeah. When I was doing, you know, some of the, the reading around for this, um, in this, you know, the study of Bodh Gaya in particular – that has had these wild changes over the past 150 years, as you've seen the dramatic rise of tourism, thinking about, you know, the, the difference between being a pilgrim and a tourist, but then also the difference between being a respectful tourist and the kind of tourist that we don't necessarily want to be. And so in particular in Bodh Gaya, you have lots of NGOs raising money for schools and there's an interesting history of fraud with those, right? So how do you make sure that you're patronizing or giving money to things that are going to respectfully engage with the local community and economy in sustainable ways versus um, falling into the traps that perpetuate educational barriers for local people who, while themselves not Buddhist, just by virtue of the fact that they live in the district of this holy Buddhist site, their lives have been changed irrevocably by this sacred site. And so what are your responsibilities as a pilgrim to learn about or behave in a certain kind of way to them? And these issues are, you know, hugely complex and are different for every different site. But, you know, in this modernity section, I'm thinking about these questions that all of us have no matter how much experience we have as a pilgrim, I'm still, you know, looking to see what other people are doing to make sure that I'm not doing the wrong thing um, to figure out how to engage the site in a way that's respectful, inspiring, beneficial, all of these different kinds of things. Yeah. All right, Kate. Well, thank you so much for the conversation today. We're, we're really excited for your course uh, and for the book as well. Uh, so this is BS 110, Pilgrimage and Buddhism. Again, it's going to run live from March 25th to April 19th. Um, thank you all so much for listening to this episode of the Yogic Studies podcast. Please consider supporting the podcast by liking, subscribing, leaving us a review on iTunes, or sharing this episode with a friend. If you're watching us here on YouTube, feel free to drop us a comment or a question below. Or you can email your questions to podcast at yogicstudies.com. All right. Thanks again so much to our guest, Dr. Kate Hartman. To all of our listeners, please take care and keep studying. Thanks so much, Seth. It was a pleasure. <laughs>